What's up, guys? What's going on, man? I'm Paul. This is Paul in Theology. I'm back, man, and we are going over judges and Pauline Theology's daily devotional. Glad you're here, man. We are on chapter six. We just got done with the song of Deborah, and now we're going to move to another um, another judge, another savior, and this one's Gideon. We're not quite there yet. We're setting up for him, but uh, we'll be on him in the uh, next podcast tomorrow. So let's go ahead and jump in. It says, Judges 6, chapter verse 1, uh, it says, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up from the livestock in their tents, and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste to the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. And when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all those who oppress you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord, your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you will dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. First thing we ask, what happened? What exactly is actually even going on right now? Well, it looks like these people are getting oppressed again. It says it's because the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Like what they did was evil. They uh, turned to the asterisk, the Baals. Matter of fact, later on in the thing, it says they're serving the gods or they fear the gods of the Amorites and the, uh, the Amalekites and the people of the land that they're living in. So they have turned their eyes away from God. And so they become oppressed. Who they come oppressed by is the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east. It said they were so vast in number, they could not be able to be counted. They were not able to be counted, man. They was huge. And a whole lot of folks, man. So many. And then every time it was like uh, they were oppressed yearly for seven years. It was like a season. Uh, you know, it was like winter, spring, summer, fall. Well, there was another season called oppression time. Because what the Israelites would do was they would plant their crops. And then when it came time for the um, for the reaping of the crops, to be able to get the the meat of the, the crop, whenever it had finally grown, then these folks would come over and just snatch all of it up. And it said it would leave none. There would be none left for the people of Israelites to eat. So they would literally uh, die. And they started getting uh, kind of scared and just... Hiding in the in the in the in the uh, caves, they built strongholds in the caves because they were afraid of these people that would come every season that the crop was ready to ripe. So that's what happened. And then it looks like after that, that um, when they cried out to the Lord, because you know that's what they do. That's the cycle. That's the judges cycle we talked about. Is that they do evil in the sight of the Lord, they get oppressed, then they cry out to God and then God raises up a deliverer and then they defeat the people who are oppressing them and then they the judge or, or whoever dies and then they go back to serving the gods of that country and this is the beginning of that so when they cry out this time I think God sends a person it says that he sends a messenger and this messenger speaks on the behalf of God and says something profound to them he tells them why this is happening. It says, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I've done all of these things for you that I uh, saved you. I, I brought to a land that you didn't even plant or anything in order for you to live there. I uh, took all of the people out before you so that you could stay. I've done all of this stuff. And the thing I ask you is don't serve the guys that are in that country, but fear me, serve me, worship me. But they did not listen. Therefore, for this reason, that is why you're oppressed. That's literally 
what the angel told them. That's what the messenger of God told them. So that's what we got. That's what's happening. As they're getting oppressed because they've served of the gods, they're crying out to God for salvation, and then God sends a messenger and tells them exactly why they are in the situation that they are in. What does this say about God? Well, I think uh, it tells us that he is faithful. So this isn't the faithfulness we always want to see. This isn't the faithfulness that we always hear about. Most of the time we talk about how faithful it is to be uh, good to us. You know, we're like, man, he is so faithful. He is always with us. He is always uh, there for us. But this is faithfulness in the fact that when he said he was going to do something, which he said, if uh, you don't serve me, then I'm going to cause the people of the land to come over you, to oppress you. I'm going to put you back as slaves like you were before. Well, he is faithful to do that. He said, if you do this, which is turn away from me, I will do that, which is uh, make you be oppressed. And he is faithful to do that. That's not the best faithfulness we want, but it is an attribute of who he is. He is faithful. Well, what do we see about, um, and actually, one more thing. I'll say he's gracious. And I know that's the main theme. And so I, I want to continue with that route. But he's gracious to at least let us know why these things are happening. When we see our lives sometimes crumbling before us, then he is gracious to let us know it's because of our sin. Now, it's not always because of our sins. So I, I don't want to make that assumption out of this scripture that we're reading. But I do want us to recognize it might be sin. And it's for us to call upon God or read his word, understand his scriptures, for us to recognize that. But he is gracious enough to show us and tell us that it's sin in our lives. He is, he is, he is not a God that doesn't speak. He's not a God that doesn't speak. That's, that's an attribute that he has, is that he is a speaking God. He is not mute, deaf, or dumb. He speaks. What's to say about us? Well, it says that we like to do whatever we want to do. I mean, we want to do what we want to do and we forget. We got really good forgetters because we know and recognize. And when I say forgetters, I don't mean like that we just don't remember. I mean, we actively turn away from the knowledge that we have because they know this. The people of Israel know this. That's why they call upon him when they're in trouble is because they know that he saved them before. He, They know that um, he has delivered them before. And so they call upon him. But as they call upon him, it's like they forget the details. They forget that uh, they were. They said that they wouldn't serve other gods. And so I think that's what man does, is that we, we forget the details. We always want the help, but forget the parameters surrounding it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, what's, how can we apply this to ourselves? Well, I think the application here is uh, to recognize the faithfulness of God. Now, I like the idea of recognizing the faithfulness of God in both ways, not just in uh, his, uh, uh, his goodness to be with us in all things, but that he actually just does what he says he's going to do. That's, that's, I think that's the biggest thing, is that remembering that God just does what he says he's going to do. Um, it's like a father, um, whenever he disciplines his child, he says, don't do that or you're going to get a spanking. And when the father gives a spanking, then the child recognizes, well, my father is going to do what he says he's going to do. And then if uh, the other way that was also so beautiful is whenever he, he, he is with us, when he, he, when he promises those things, he says, if you walk with me, uh, I will lift you up and I will strengthen you and I will be your strength. It's in, in weakness, we are made strong. And so when we are broken down and beaten down, that we can overcome and be strong through Christ, those are beautiful promises. Just like a father when he's like, hey, man, if you get your work done, we'll go play some baseball. We'll go play catch outside. You get your work done and your dad plays catch with you outside. That's faithfulness, too. So in both ways, I think we need to remember that faithfulness. But I think that remembering the faithfulness also is we should be faithful. Like when God calls us to do something, he tells us to do this, we should do it. We should uh, remember how good he was and then operate out of that light, which when I say that, I mean that we should act upon the things we know about him, the character that we see about him, the, the um, who he is, what he's done, what we know, 
then that should cause us to live a certain way, a wonderful way, a beautiful way. I appreciate you guys for listening. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see y'all uh, next week, man. Or, I don't know why I said next week, but we'll see you guys tomorrow.